What's up, my wizards? It's Dev. SBMTG, we like it. A magic found my glasses. That's the first piece of good news. Second piece is, it's Brewer's Choice today. That means I get to talk about whatever I want to talk about. Usually, I let my patrons pick what videos we do around these parts, but like once a week or so, I like to take the reins, talk about something that's been on my mind. Now today, I'm going to take that opportunity to kind of step out of my comfort zone a little bit, do something I don't do very often, which is talk about EDH. Because just recently, I was taking a little stroll down memory lane, you know, kind of looking at an old classic favorite magic set of mine. And as I was doing that, I was kind of surprised at how many really good EDH playables are in the dark. Now before we jump into my top 20 EDH cards from this set, let me just take a moment to talk about the dark. Just 30 seconds to a minute or so, I'm not going to waste too much of your time, but there's a reason this is one of my favorite sets ever, ever, ever. In terms of flavor and theme and artwork and just overall, this is most important, tone. This set is pitch perfect. Everything is bleak and gloomy and dark, but in the good way, if that <laughs> makes any sense. Now, we're still in Dominaria for this early set, but we're years out from the Brothers' War at this point. But just because that conflict is over doesn't mean that we're not still feeling the ripple effects, the aftermath of that conflict. Dominaria is a cold place at this point, and it's basically kind of a feudal dual theocracy system. We're ruled by two different churches, but there's a huge degree of disparity. Commoners at this point in Dominaria may as well be serfs. Now we're almost at the list, promise, just wanted to set the tone a little bit here. Now, there are a lot of cards in this set that I want to highlight, so I've got a number of honorable mentions in this video with an S in parentheses, because I'm probably only going to get to talk about the set once, so I want to mention all the things that I want to while I have time to do that. So let's run into these real quick. I don't want to waste too much of your time, but first of all, this set has a lot of cards that are really good against specific colors. I don't want to put them on the main list, but if your opponent is on black in your EDH group, or they have a really good black commander that you want to deal with, try Exorcist. This just taps to kill black creatures. That's <laughs> ridiculous. So it could go on the main list, but again, it's highly specific, so I wanted to keep it off. Same thing with Hidden Path. I have always loved this card. This is really good against pretty much anyone playing Basic Forest in your playgroup. Do worry about the crackback, because if you can cast this card in the first place, it's safe to say you likely have a forest. Your opponent can get in on you too, but this can kill a green player all in one stroke. Similarly, some of these cards are good against specific strategies rather than specific colors. If your opponent's playing a Goblin's deck of any kind in your playgroup, then try Tividar's Crusade to make them cry. This just destroys all the Goblins at a pretty reasonable cost, but that said, if you're on Goblins in your playgroup, you definitely want to pick up Goblin Wizard. This is actually one of the most expensive cards in the set at about 30 bucks on TCG Player, and a near mint copy will cost more than that. But there's a good reason for that. This just taps to play Goblins for free, which is crazy. There's also in Inferno and Ball Lightning. Now, Inferno is just obviously good for EDH, and it's a pretty famous card from the set, so I feel like I should bring it up. Ball Lightning, not very good for EDH, but this is the Dark. This is one of the most famous cards in the set, and I don't think people would let me get away with it if I didn't mention it at some point. Now, finally, as far as honorable mentions, just one more category here, because there are some cards in this set that are semi-famous for one reason or another in EDH play, but I actually don't think they're as good as their reputation would lead you to believe, like Worms of the Earth. You start reading this card, and you start getting very excited. But once you get to the very end, you realize people can just pay five life to get rid of it, and they will every single time. So this isn't as powerful as you may have been led to believe. Same thing with Mind Bomb. This is another card that people would not let me get away with not mentioning. This looks like it makes everyone discard three cards, but it's usually just a bolt to each player, which can be good, but it's no, nowhere near as good as making people discard stuff. And sometimes people will be more than happy to put stuff in their graveyard, depending on who their commander is. There's also Curse Artifact. Semi-famous because it's one of the only black cards that even really does anything to artifacts at all, but it doesn't destroy the artifact. And in EDH, two life a turn really isn't that high of a price to pay. So again, Curse Artifact, not super great, even though it does have some degree of infamy because it's a black card that mentions artifacts at all. But... <laughs> Probably the best of this cycle is Scarwood Bandits. This is the last card I want to talk about before I get to the main list here. This just steals artifacts, and there's no limit to the number of artifacts it can steal, so it's a pretty decent looking card, but your opponent can just pay two mana to not let you steal their artifact, which kind of puts a damper on your situation. 
But here we are at the actual list. We made it, you guys. Number 20, Barl's Cage. We'll start off with this card. I wanted to put this in the honorable mentions, but I think it's just good enough to graze the main list, you know. EDH decks that play green or blue or have, you know, similar lack of options in their removal spots might actually consider Barl's Cage. I've seen it at a table more than once. Here we are, number 19, Sunken City. Look at that price tag, 20 cents, less than a quarter, for a really cool card from like 1994. That's, that's awesome. I mean, how cool does the card look, for one thing? But second of all, the effect is very, very nice. A lot of blue decks really don't mind, especially in Commander, where you've got some mana, one would assume. You don't mind paying an extra two every single turn to lock down this card's effect, and it's actually not bad in certain decks. You know, you're playing Thassa, Seems like a decent card to pick up one slot, you know, or maybe even Maloku. You're playing like favorable wins and this card, you get multiple anthem effects. So you just don't see a crusade effect very often in blue. And do note that this does give opposing blue creatures the plus one, plus one as well. So you got to contend with that. But in any blue commander deck that actually does focus on aggro, they're few and far between, but they do exist. This is a slot you might want to consider. And number 18 is Skull of Orm. Card has to be on my list. This actually has the distinction of being the first card I ever saw from the dark. And it's still one of my favorite cards to this day. When I was 11, I thought this card was awesome. I didn't even really care what the text was. I just love the art. <laughs> you know? But this is actually not half bad in Commander, it turns out. The ability costs a ton to activate, but it can effectively be a second copy of Hannah if Hannah's your commander or just if she's in your deck, period. And this works really well with Urtai. You know, it creates a loop where you can just pick enchantments, or you can counter stuff by discarding enchantments or sacrificing enchantments, excuse me. Um, and then just get them back with Skull of Orm. You create this loop where you always have a counter spell up. So that's really neat too. Skull of Orm may be a personal favorite of mine, but it does have plenty of use in the format. Number 17 is Elves of Deep Shadow. This card is just sort of obvious. There's a couple of cards on the list like that. And of course, you don't have to pick up the dark version of Elves of Deep Shadow. But don't you want the goth the goth girl version of Elves of Deep Shadow? It's a really good art right here. Um, and this is a well-known card in EDH, but this is the set that it's originally from, so I do think that it needs to be spotlighted just a little bit. You've probably seen this card at your playgroup at the table before um, in one form or another, but very likely you may not have even known that this existed. This is the set it's originally from, and it's a good pickup at just about six bucks if you want the coolest version possible. Number 16 is a weird one. It's Witch Hunter. This is a white thing that bounces stuff and just deals damage directly to players. Like, these are two effects you do not often see on white cards. And, by the way, it doesn't look like much, but that second ability, Bounce a Creature, an opponent's creature specifically, is very, very good actually is. You can play politics this way, by the way, by, say, returning something with an Enter the Battlefield trigger to a friendly opponent's hand. You can do that, but of course, you can just keep your opponent off of playing their best creature. Just keep Witch Hunter tapped down every single turn to effectively keep getting rid of their best creature that they keep trying to play. So, Witch Hunter a lot better than it looks. I'm number 15, I'm cheating just a little bit here, but bear with me, because number 15 is a combo. There's Merfolk Assassin and War Barge. This combo strikes fear to this day in the hearts of old school players. And you may have never seen this, so I just really wanted to showcase this combo, and I probably could have put it in the honorable mentions, but if you actually have a playgroup that plays at a, a sufficient speed to get this combo to work, then it is still a dangerous combo, you know? Have your Merfolk ride the barge in, give some other creature island walk, and then suddenly... Merfolk Assassin just taps to kill anything. That's nuts, and it was crazy in 1994. It's baked into the set, even though we didn't really play Limited back then. Imagine if we did. Getting Assassin plus War Barge would be the best thing you could do in Limited, but it works in EDH to this day. Now, my number 14 is Martyr's Cry. You may have never seen this card in your entire life. It's only been printed in paper this one time. It was printed in a Master's Edition, but that's only available on Magic Online. So the only paper printing of this card available is the Dark, and you, again i have likely not seen this card. This works in a couple of ways. At first, I wanted to put this in the honorable mention section for cards that are good against specific colors because it's just a wrath specifically for white creatures that exiles those creatures too. That's pretty ridiculous. But 
What it actually can do is, you know, play beneficial to you if you're playing white creatures. Note, too, that this doesn't say non-token or anything. Not even the errata on it, the Oracle um, translation, says non-token or anything. So if you just have a bunch of white token creatures out, this card gets crazy because it just allows you to draw all of your deck all at once. You know, how many tokens decks have you seen or played in EDH at this point that just fill the entire board with tokens? Well, if they're white, you get to draw your entire deck, and I'm pretty sure that's a tough situation to actually make work, but if you can, this card is more or less broken. But number 13 here is Dance of Many. Now, that is a lot of text. That's a ton of text. Let me tell you what it boils down to. Clone any creature on the battlefield for two mana. Pay two mana every turn to keep this thing out. That's it. That's all. Oh, well, whatever. So whatever you're playing with or whatever busted crap your opponent's playing with, you can copy that creature for two mana. It's a two mana clone. All the thing is here is that you have to pay two mana every turn. What? Who cares about that? You know, again, ZDH, you've got some mana at your disposal, one would imagine, especially in the late game, where two mana clones are crazy and having to pay two extra mana every turn is just completely non-secular. It doesn't matter at all. So this card is crazy, and it's something else that you may have possibly never seen. Now, I'm probably going to butcher number 12's name. I haven't known how to say this ever since I was 11 years old, but I'm going to try for it. Niall Sylvan is the name of this thing. First of all, doesn't it look awesome? It's really, really cool art. But in any case, despite the green commitment, this is great. One of the number one things you have to worry about in Commander is removal. People devote, you know, 20-ish <laughs> slots to it in some Commander decks or more occasionally in these Control Commander decks. You'll see more than that. But even the, you know, most aggro commander deck or most combo-oriented commander deck will devote some slots to removal. So this can just let you regenerate guys. I mean, again, at a pretty big mana cost and a huge commitment to green, but it's pretty nice to have a Nihal around. We're already on number 11, you guys. It's Safe Haven. You might be a little surprised to see this, but this is just a perennial EDH card. And I'm surprised it's not on more people's lists of, like, good EDH lands or, you know, stuff we just don't talk about very often. You see lists like that every now and again on YouTube, you know, like, underused EDH cards. You just never see this card, and I'm always surprised by that. Because it can just save your guys. Yeah, that's, uh, again, removal is everywhere in Commander, whether it's Wrath Effects or just spot removal or whatever, and this can save your dues at a pretty low cost of two mana. Even if you're just saving one guy from a Wrath Effect, that's better than pretty much everyone else on the table did. And you can also use this to just repeat enter the battlefield triggers that are super abusable. You know, who even cares how much the creature cost? Again, this is EDH. Once you get into the relative late game, two extra mana to put a guy under safe haven and then pop him back out a turn later or whenever is not so bad if you've got a dumb enough ETB trigger. But my number 10, just cracking the top 10 here, is actually another land that's kind of like Safe Haven in some ways, but also not like Safe Haven in other ways. Number 10 is City of Shadows. This too is one of the more expensive cards in the set, at about 25 30 bucks a pop, but in some EDH decks, it's going to be worth it. Just like a Safe Haven, this can actually tap for free to save your guys from removal. You obviously can't get your dudes back. You know, I don't know how to, to what extent you're saving them, but you can get extra value out of them by being able to tap City of Shadows for more and more mana as the game goes on. So if you're, any of your stuff gets targeted by spot removal, why not just exile it, remove it, put it under City of Shadows, and by the end of the game, suddenly City of Shadows is tapping for three or four mana at a time, and that gets nuts quick. But number nine is Felwar Stone. Super famous card, right? I mean, yeah, it only produces mana that your opponents can produce. That sounds kind of jank, but this is EDH because, you know, if you're playing at a big enough table, or even if you're only playing with, like, three other people, you got a four-player game going, then it's very likely that this just taps for any color of mana. And a two-mana rock is actually not bad <laughs> in and of itself. And one that you can tap for pretty much five colors, if not four of the five colors, is going to be good, and its price reflects that. But a card that's really, really good, and its price doesn't reflect it, is Gia's Touch. I think it's Gia. If it's got an I in it, it's Gaia's. If it's got an E in it, it's Gia's. I always get hit over how I pronounce this, but Touch is crazy. You know, in mono green EDH decks that basically play nothing but forests and maybe a couple of other lands here and there, um, this card is... Stupid. Like a two-mana Wayward Sword to so long as you play 
forests and nothing else, which is just fine. But even if you're not playing just forests, then see, then touch can sacrifice for two green mana on the next turn, which really leads to some dope acceleration. So I don't know why this card is not more expensive. Probably the low rarity is what's keeping it at around a dollar or something like that. But it's actually one of the best selling cards from the dark for EDH play. And you can see why this card is juiced. Now my number seven is going to surprise some people that have made it all the way up here on the list, but then other old school players are going to be like, yeah, this is probably top five. So my number seven is Reflecting Mirror. This is crazy. Once you actually have it out and the mana to use it, which again, EDH, you got some mana, hopefully you get to that point in the game, then this can just keep your opponents off of targeting you with pretty much anything because it's going to get shot right back in their face. A lot of fun has been made over the art of... <laughs> On this card, you know, check out this new CD I got. The card is actually really, really workable in control type EDH deck. So give this thing another look if you haven't yet. Number six, we're getting pretty far down the list here, is Preacher. Finally, Preacher. I know some people have been looking for it <laughs> this whole list. I put this a good ways down because this card is so dumb. It's a white card that steals creatures. You really don't see that every day. A fair amount of breaking of the color pie, especially in white in this set. You know, Witch Hunter breaks the color pie. Martyr's Cry allows white decks to draw cards. That, you don't see that every day. And now this. Now, I will admit, the effect doesn't look super desirable at first, because your opponent gets to pick what creature you get. So against a playgroup that plays nothing but goblins and elves and stuff, they're just going to give you their crappest creature. A deck that plays tokens is going to give you a 1-1 token. I get that. But, but, by that same to token, <laughs> lol, lol, any deck that doesn't play that many creatures is going to get wrecked by Preacher. And do note, by the way, that if your opponent you know, plays a creature and it's their only creature, Preacher is ridiculous against them, and that's not an uncommon situation in some EDH playgroups where people don't play their first creature until turn four. <laughs> it happens from time to time, so Preacher can be insanely effective against some decks and on some boards. But number five, we're getting into the heavy hitters now, guys, because you probably all heard of Maze of Ith at this point. That card's all the way up here because most EDH decks where the owner has a Maze of Ith, Maze of Ith will miraculously work its way <laughs> into said EDH deck. There's just not a whole lot of cost to putting this in your mana base. It doesn't actually produce mana, which does kind of suck. That will hold you up occasionally, don't get me wrong. It's the worst thing about the card, but being able to just say, no, that huge guy doesn't deal damage to me is really, really good, and I shouldn't have to tell you that. Maze of Ith goes in a lot of commander decks. Also, no, before I move on from this card, just a little Easter egg from the olden days, you can actually see a guy, you can't, my finger won't shut because I can't do that, but you can actually see a guy outlined in green, kind of cocooned into the maze on this card. Really take a look at the art on this if you've never noticed that before. Blew my mind the first time I noticed it 20 years ago. But number four, ladies and gentlemen, is Stone Calendar. This does not look like much at five mana, Right, but this is basically a Helm of Awakening that only works for you, and I've seen this on many an EDH table in my time, and I've seen it on many a table in my time before we even had a format such as Commander. I've seen a lot of Stone Calendars played, and even though you can definitely make the argument that it was much better in olden days, it's still not bad on the Commander table in 2019, because being the only player that gets Helm of Awakening is pretty good on turn 6, where you can just unload your entire hand. Here we are, everybody. Top three moment we've all been waiting for. Well, I guess number one is, but top three, that's something. Number three, Season of the Witch. Ladies and gentlemen, how awesome is this card? Just how cool does it look? How awesome is that name? It's just, despite that it makes you think of one of the worst Halloween movies, but just put that out of your mind. This is, this is an awesome card. Basically, every creature gets nettling imped every single turn. It has to attack or it's dead. And that's actually better than it sounds in EDH, especially against commanders that aren't necessarily offensive-minded, which is kind of the majority of a lot of commanders. Two life a turn is really not much to ask for this effect, which almost works like a drop of honey against some decks and is just a wrath effect. <laughs> against other decks, you know. It does not look like much at first glance, but making your opponent attack with creatures they don't necessarily want to attack with is not necessarily the best thing for them some of the time. You, it should come as no surprise. 
It also kicks off a trend in the top three of I'm a jerk cards. The Dark has a lot of these, you know. Season of the Witch, I'm a jerk. You could say the same thing about number two and number one, but number two is Mana Vortex, leaving no doubt to a lot of people as to what number one is, as if there was any doubt to begin with. Mana Vortex could actually be better than number one, as a matter of fact. This is Mono Blue Land Destruction. You don't... <laughs> You don't really see that every day. And there's a lot of times where Mana Vortex might not benefit you at all, especially considering you have to sacrifice a land first when you actually get it down. But aside from that, this is one of the ultimate I'm a total jerk cards in EDH, and people seem to really like those. Also, again, this is another example of a card with really sweet art. This is another one of the best-looking cards in the entire set to me. It's just so gorgeous, and the name is cool, but the effect is really, really good, too. If it's not actively good, then it's, at the very least, very, very annoying. You know, you strip mine an opponent every single turn, so that's just... I probably shouldn't have to tell you how nuts that is. If this card doesn't look powerful to you, I don't know what to tell you. But number one, drum roll, unnecessary drum roll here for Blood Moon, because you knew if I hadn't talked about it yet, it was probably going to come up in the top ten, and then the top five, and the top three, and I hadn't talked about it yet, so Blood Moon's number one, obviously. <laughs> Again, I think you could easily make the argument that Mana Vortex is better, but Blood Moon is just, I don't know, maybe it has the better reputation, and it is a lot more annoying against a lot more decks. Just because they don't have to sacrifice their lands doesn't mean that they can use <laughs> their lands <laughs> to cast their spells, and Blood Moon is just one of the dumbest, most annoying cards to see on the table in pretty much any format, EDH included. Plus, I'm kind of a nerd for moons. Aside from my personal preference for not only this card and my nostalgia for it, but moons in general for whatever weird reason, this card is just also extremely good, undeniably good, undeniably annoying, and very, very famous for being those things. But that's my list. Let me know if I missed anything, all you old school people and new school people or people that are like just getting into magic because of Arena. I know you've probably never seen like any <laughs> of these cards, so I hope that this kind of nostalgia trip, um, this, this history lesson was just that. You know, I hope it was useful to you in some way or is at least cool to see some of these old cards, you know, especially the beautiful old borders and the artwork. It's, mm, it's gorgeous. The cards are gorgeous, you guys. But I hope that no matter what kind of player you are, this is a fun, informative video for you, and it gave you some ideas for your EDH decks, but do YouTube stuff while you're at it. You know, like the video, follow me on Twitter at SBMTGDev, subscribe if you're new or if you haven't done it yet, hit the bell for the notifications, throw a dollar in the Patreon pot to vote on what decks you want to see next, and I'll let you know what's happening 24 hours in advance. All for a buck a month, Hit the link in the description, go to Patreon. And if you wanted to check out any of these cards, you can get them for the absolute lowest prices. And very often, you can get them for lower prices than I listed in the video if you're okay with like moderately played stuff over on TCG Player. Even lightly played cards will often be less than the price I've listed in the video. Not all the time, but sometimes. And if you're careful what vendors you get them from, you can get some of these cards at a very, very low price. So click the link in the description for TCG Player to get all these cards in a compact list and you can go from there. Anyway, I'm Dev <laughs> from The Place, and I'll catch you cats later. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Make sure, no matter what you do, you spread love and you be kind. Here's the Patreon people.